Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight we continue on with our series from the Book of Revelation. In fact, we're very close to finishing it. Uh, we're in chapter 20, so there's only two more chapters after uh, tonight to come. Uh, Lesson-wise, this is lesson number 18. And we're at that point. Last week we had a look at the return of Jesus, and this week we see the consequences of it. And that's, of course, Satan's uh, inevitable doom which the bible lets us know will happen now the book of revelation describes a vision that god gives to the apostle john regarding the end times or the end of days as we know it and ultimately it reveals to us what will happen as punishment for the sins of mankind when god pours out his wrath during a period of seven years of tribulation known as the great tribulation During this time, humanity will be called to repentance and will ultimately worship him only. Now, in the previous lesson from Revelation 19, the Apostle John first witnessed 24 elders in the throne, surrounding the throne of God in heaven. And of course, there's four living creatures, the cherubim angels that surround God's throne with him. They were praising and worshipping God with a great multitude of saints before heaven opens up and Jesus rides out on a white horse. Now he rides out to capture the beast, and the beast of course is the Antichrist, and also the false prophet, and to cast them into the fiery lake of burning sulfur as it's known. And this of course is a description which we could place akin to hot molten lava in a volcano. He then went on to kill the kings of the earth and their armies at Armageddon, which of course is in Megiddo in northern Israel. Now this was a a description, I beg your pardon, of the triumphant return of Jesus the Messiah. So if you'd like to learn what happens and why, I'll put up the information at the end of the lesson, but you'll be able to watch this on our YouTube channel uh, by typing in Paul Brunson, The Jesus Movement, or you can go to our website, which is thejesusmovement.com.au. Now in this lesson, from Revelation 20, the Apostle John first witnesses an angel coming down from heaven, which tells us again that he is still here on earth, with the key to the abyss and a great chain to bind Satan and throw him into the abyss to be locked away for a thousand years, during which Jesus Christ will reign here on earth with the saints who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and the word of God. Now after a thousand years, Satan will be released again for a short time in which he will gather an army only to be defeated for one last time and cast into the fiery lake of burning sulfur where the beast, the antichrist and the false prophet have already been cast to be tormented for all of eternity. So this is it. This is the doom of Satan that we're going to look at tonight. So let's begin and open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. We're going to begin with verse 1 to learn how a nameless angel comes to bind Satan for a thousand years. So again, if you can open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to begin with verse 1. And it reads, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Now, the angel, interestingly, in this, that's going to subdue Satan, who we put on a pedestal, probably. I mean, it's our second name of conversation, usually, in terms of our faith. But it's an anonymous, unnamed angel who will bring the key to the abyss and the great chain. So it's not the Father, it's not Jesus, and nor is it an archangel, Michael or Gabriel. So the ultimate importance of Satan is indicated by this simple declaration. So my first question for tonight is, what does this opening declaration say about the importance of Satan? What do you think it says about the importance of Satan? The least in heaven is even more powerful than he is. Right. Any other thoughts? That he's powerless. That he's powerless. The thing is, is that 
when Satan got cast out of heaven, what did he try and do? He tried to? Well, he tried to be like God. Be like God. Because he thought by being around the throne of God that he witnessed everything that happened and probably thought, oh, I can do this myself. And so he became proud and arrogant and God cast him out of heaven as a result. So the message here is that Satan is not God's opposite, which is obvious. You know, we talk about good and evil, for example. So that's God and Satan. So we can often portray him on the same level as God. But he is not God's opposite or equal, and he has never been so. So God can easily stop Satan's activity any time, and yet he has allowed him to continue because it serves his purposes to do so. And so in the introduction tonight, I mentioned that Satan is going to be released again. And you might think, well, why on earth would God release him again? And again, it's because God has a purpose for doing so. So let's now go to Revelation chapter 20 again, verse 2 to 3 this time, to see how Satan will be detained for 1,000 years. So again, Revelation 20, verses 2 to 3, and it reads, He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, so this of course is the unnamed angel, and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must, notice the words, he must be set free for a short time. So in other words, this is God's word, so God has a purpose in him being released once again. I'm going to ask you, but I'm not going to ask you yet. We'll ask you later why you think so. So the Apostle John says that Satan will be seized, bound, thrown, locked and sealed into the abyss. You'll recall Satan tried to imprison Jesus in a tomb, but what happened? Three days later he was not there. The, the tomb was, remember, sealed. Defeated. Jesus was bound and was, he was wrapped, etc, etc. But death could not hold him down. So here we learn that God has no problem, on the other hand, restraining Satan, but his incarceration in this instance is not for punishment, because that would be a end of the road situation. It is actually for the purposes of restraint. So in other words, he's going to be restrained for 1,000 years because God has a purpose for that. Now restraint, will see his influence here on earth grind to a halt. So in other words, it's going to change the whole status of people here on earth. So please, we have to, you know, uh, what do I want to say? We have to, you know, I'm saying please because we have to be really careful here because there is no man on earth who can bind Satan. Sometimes in prayer, you may have heard this, where people say, in Jesus' name I bind A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay? This is a man-made thing. This is not a god godly thing. There is only God who can bind Satan. Satan has powers greater than you and I. And so we have to be really careful what we say here. But then the people misinterpret that scripture where they say what you bound in heaven, what you bound on earth will be bound in heaven. So we, he gave that description to his disciples. Right. So a lot of people misinterpret it. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. something to be very, very careful mm -hmm. of. That's exactly right. So it will, and this is the message, it will only occur at the command of God. Now, my next question is that verse 3 that we've just read reveals the main mode of Satan's attack on earth. So what is that, if you read that? What is Satan's main mode of attack here on earth? Deception. Deception. And so, again, my mind goes off to Hollywood and all the ferocious movies with these satanic beasts with flames and buildings exploding and all the rest of it going on. 
But the reality is, Satan's specialty is deception. If we go right back to the beginning of the Bible, what's the first thing he did? He caused doubt and deception in Adam and Eve and got a consequence which has affected mankind for the rest of time. So the scripture says here, to keep him from deceiving the nation. So Satan is a deceiver. And you might remember Jesus said he is a liar and a deceiver right from the beginning. And so it is. So my next question is, what is the best defense and weapon that you can have against Satan? What is your best defense and weapon? The word. The word because? Because it's truth. The truth. Thank you. So if Satan is a deceiver, he speaks False. lies, mm -hmm. falsehoods. And so our best weapon against that, of course, is to speak the truth. And the truth that we speak is the truth of God's word, which, of course, you find in your Bible, as we call it. And so your best weapon, best defense, is to read and know your word because your word is God's word. And that's the truth. And that's what we need to stand by. So the truth is always, and that's what we find if we read the course of the Bible, the truth is always against Satan. And so falsehood is his recourse and instrument, this delusion of mankind getting them to accept and follow lies and false hopes under the persuasion that they are accepting and following the truth it is the great work and the business of Satan. So oftentimes in life we may get swindled as we call it or we may get convinced to do something or to buy something and it's lies, it's deception, it's not true. And so what are we doing? We're being convinced to follow something that's false and we readily fall into it. You know, a lot of people we would call gullible because it's easy to fool them. And so this is the method of Satan. So Satan's work, of course, of deception continues today. So we know he is currently not bound, as he will be. We know Satan was not bound at the finished work of Jesus on the cross, which he could have been. And he wasn't bound at the time of the resurrection or at the time of the founding of the church. So the Apostle Peter says, uh, we're going to go to a reference from 1 Peter, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, not far in front of the book of Revelation. So it's 1 Peter, verses 5, uh, sorry, chapter 5, verse 8. And what he says to us is, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And so Peter counsels us and warns us to be self-controlled and alert and to understand that the enemy is always prowling around and seeking to deceive us. So we are told to resist him and to stand firm in our faith. Now also in verse 3, the Apostle John reveals Satan will be removed from action for 1,000 years. And this 1,000 year period is normally called the millennium. So when we talk about it, we talk about the millennial period or the millennium. Now unfortunately throughout history, the history of the church has uh, played in this as well, but there are many, many different ways of the millennium being, I wouldn't say understood, but being interpreted. So in other words, what's been put out is not true. But the Bible speaks clearly about this. There are those who have ignored or denied the promise of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And I could give you a whole history lesson on the church here. Uh, a long and detailed history where it's gone wrong but I'm not going to do that because I'd rather focus on what the Bible has to say. So I'm not going to pay homage to the false interpretations but make it clear that Jesus Christ will, and there's the words, will return to this earth before the millennial earth uh, to conquer Satan. In other words, he conquers Satan before the thousand years 
We read chapter 19 of Revelation previous week and we saw that he overcame the Antichrist and the false prophet and they were cast into the lake of fire. In tonight's scripture from chapter 20, we will learn that he will cast Satan in there with him and he will be defeated. Now, of course, this happens before Jesus sits down to rule here on earth. Okay, so that's all we need to know exactly what the book of Revelation tells us. And he will, of course, establish his rule and his government here on earth. Now, the earthly reign of Christ and his people is plainly taught in both the Old and the New Testament. And I've got a bunch of references here, uh, which if anyone wants them afterwards or wants to write to me, I'm happy to send them out. Uh, can be found in Psalm 72, in Isaiah chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 23, Matthew chapter 5, Luke chapter 1 and chapter 19, and frankly, many, many more. In fact, so many more, there's actually 400 verses in more than 20 different passages in the Old Testament which deal with this time when Jesus Christ will rule and reign personally over planet Earth. So anyone who's got Google and puts in some references or pertinent words, you'll get a lot of reading that comes out of this. Or even better, you can go to your Bible concordance and look it up. So, uh, so yeah, take some time and have a look at those. The point is, is that the millennial rule is not new to us when we get to the book of Revelation. It's throughout the Bible. Now there's a parable that we read that's known as the parable of the sheep and the goats. And this is, of course is given by Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 and it's from verses 31 to 46. So it's a fairly lengthy piece of scripture. But it begins by saying, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another. What you may not have realized if you've read that on its own in the past is that this is talking about what's happening right now in the book of Revelation. So the people that Jesus will judge are actually those who survived the great tribulation here on earth at the beginning of the millennial rule. Why do we know that? Because it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, which means that's when he returns. Okay, and it says the angels will come with him, he will sit on the throne, and of course in the scriptures as we go forward it talks about the throne itself. So, uh, so that is what that time will be from the parable of the sheep and the goats. So knowing that, take a moment, reread that scripture, and then again you'll have fresh eyes on it. Now the Bible tells us the rule of Jesus here on earth when Satan is defeated is a period, and it repeats this, is a period of a thousand years. So we're going to take a quick look at some of what we know about this period of time from other passages of scripture. Now I'm going to read each of these scriptures but at this point <coughs> take notice of the main points of what it's saying. So from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, and Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 22 to 24, during the millennium, it says that Israel will be the superpower of the world, the leading nation in all the earth, and the center of Israel, which means the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, will be the mountain of the Lord's house in which the capital of the government of Messiah will reside. So in other words, all nations shall flow to the capital of Jesus' government. So the capital of the world will be Jerusalem itself. So these scriptures point to this. Now the second one again is from Isaiah chapter 2. And it says that during the millennium, the millennium, beg your pardon, the citizens of earth will acknowledge and submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Okay, so that means he's going to rule and they will submit to his rule. 
and it will be a time of perfectly administered, enforced righteousness on this earth. Okay, so that's Isaiah chapter 2 as well. The third one, again from Isaiah chapter 2. During the millennium, there will be no war. So in other words, it's going to be the first time here on earth for a thousand years where there is no war. There will still, <coughs> excuse me, there will still be conflicts between nations and individuals, but they will be justly and decisively resolved by the Messiah and those who reign with him. Does that surprise you? When the Messiah comes, will there still be problems between people? Of course, because there's still people. people and they still have a sin nature, even though Christ is here with them. So the difference is, of course, is they have a righteous ruler to adjudicate and judge in a, in a righteous manner. Now, it isn't the reign of the Messiah itself, and this is the point, that will change the heart of man. Citizens of earth will still need to trust in Jesus and in his work on their behalf for their personal salvation during the millennium. But war and armed conflict will not be tolerated. So in other words, salvation is still only through Jesus Christ, even though he's ruling from earth during that period of time. Now Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9, again for during the millennium, it says, the way that animals relate to each other and to humans will be transformed. So I asked you the question, how did humans and animals relate to one another in the beginning? Did we eat no. the animals? No, we didn't. And so what we're being told is that a little child, for example, will be safe and able to lead a wolf or a leopard or a young lion or a bear. Even the danger of predators like cobras and vipers will be gone during that period of time. So in other words, there's not going to be any sort of death caused by this, these animals. Now in Genesis chapter 9 verses 2 to 3, that's the portion of the Bible where the Lord gave Noah and all of mankind after him the permission to eat meat. So that was when it changed. So at the same time, the Lord put the dread of man into animals so they would not be effortless prey for humans. So one of the things that stops us from just going up to a dangerous animal of course is our fear of them. And so it stops us from killing everything. Now in the reign of the Messiah, this will be reversed. For this reason, many people think that during the reign of the Messiah, that humans will return to being vegetarians, as it seems they were in the beginning. Okay, so unusual thought for the future, uh, but this is what comes out of the scriptures. Ch uh, fifth point. <coughs> Excuse me, several references. Isaiah chapter 55, Jeremiah 30, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 37 and Hosea chapter 3. During the millennial, King David will have a prominent place in the millennial earth because he will rule over Israel itself. So even though Jesus will rule over the whole earth, David will be responsible to rule over Israel itself. You may be learning some new stuff right now. It takes a bit of research through your Bible. But you can see it's a, uh, quite a lot of information about what it'll look like at that point in time in the future. The sixth point in Amos chapter 9, during the millennium, there will be blessing and security for national Israel. So in other words, it's going to be a blessed nation once again. The seventh point, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1 to 9, during the millennium, it will be a time of purity and devotion to God, which is what we would expect with Jesus ruling right makes a lot of sense but there will be a time of purity and devotion to god the eighth point is from luke 19 verses 11 to 27 revelation chapter 20 that we're in right now revelation chapter 2 we've looked at revelation chapter 3 we've looked at and also from 1 corinthians chapter 6 it says that during the millennium saints in their resurrected state will be given responsibility in the millennial earth in other words the Lord will have a task or a function for each of them to perform. Okay, So that's all stuff which we can look forward to that will happen at this time. Now the ninth and last point 
um, predominantly all from Ezekiel uh, chapters 37, chapter 20, chapters 40 right through to 48. It talks about the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem. We spoke about this before because the millennium is used in conjunction with this where people say that the temple will be rebuilt and services restored to the earth as a, memorial, as a memorial of God's work in the past. But I don't agree with this. And the reason I don't agree with this is because of scripture itself. First of all, Ezekiel was given these visions about the second temple when he was in exile after the destruction of the first temple. He was in Babylon. Secondly, there is no need for a temple in which God will descend. Why? Because Jesus is going to be there ruling here on earth. You don't need to go to the temple to come before the Lord anymore because he's physically there. And the scriptures that we're about to read tell you that he has a throne there, a throne of judgment. And thirdly, when we read Revelation chapter 21, it says in the New Jerusalem that the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So we have to be um, careful with what we're interpreting here. Okay, so the millennial is important. So a lot of information about this time. Hopefully it gives you a bit of a future look. Interestingly, it's not all documented in the book of Revelation. Of course, it's documented in a lot of the prophetic words that came in the Old Testament. But the millennium is important because it will demonstrate Jesus' victory and worthiness to rule the nations and it will also reveal the depth of man's rebellious nature why because they're now in a perfect environment why because satan has been locked away in the abyss so meaning that this the point in time there is no influence from satan and jesus is actually ruling so of course we expect during this time that there would be nothing going wrong but of course there is why because man himself has a sin nature and so what this does is it distills things many people believe and we're talking about this on sunday many people believe that mankind is basically good and really want god's righteous rule and many believe mankind is innocent and only corrupted by the bad environment that they live within. But we all know that we are sinners and we need Jesus regardless of the environment we live in. And in the millennium, this will be exactly the same. And this will answer the questions before the great judgment in Revelation chapter 20 that we're in now. We're gonna look at that in verses 11 to 15 in a few moments that we're about to come to. Now finally, this portion of scripture ends with us learning that Satan must be set free for a short time again, and it will be revealed how Satan is eternally depraved. In other words, he is never, ever going to change. So we're gonna work our way through to that. So we're gonna go now to verse four of Revelation chapter 20 to hear how the saints will live and reign with Jesus for a thousand years. Now it says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, the beast of course meaning the Antichrist, or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now there's speculation, of course, this is what happens with the book of Revelation, as to who are seated on the thrones, because it doesn't say in as many words. Now some say, of course, because of the book of Revelation, that the 24 heavenly elders are those that they're talking about here. It doesn't specify how many thrones, of course. Some say that it's all the saints from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 to 3, which we can read at another time, but it talks about all of the saints. And some say it's the apostles from Matthew 19, verse 28. So, of course, Jesus tells his apostles that they will be judging and ruling with him. 
But I can eliminate the 12 apostles because it says they will judge who? Does anyone remember? What, who will they actually judge? Is it all of these people at this time? The Jews. Right. He will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So we know that it can't be them because, of course, this judgment is for all people of all nations on the earth at this time. The 24 elders fulfill their duties where? In the heavenly throne room of God, whereas this is a throne that's down here on earth. So it only leaves fellow saints who have also suffered at the hands of Satan's henchmen, whose punishment of beheading is for a very specific reason. And the Bible repeats this to us because it says it's for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. So the execution of so many is being is because they refuse to worship the Antichrist and receive the mark of the beast on their forehead and their hand. And so they will reign whilst Satan is bound in the abyss as the earth transitions from the Great Tribulation to its eventual renewal. Okay, so we don't know, we don't have a quantity for these people, but we have an idea of who they are, who will rule and reign with Jesus. Now he did say three categories of people, but I'm pretty confident that two of those it doesn't apply to. So it is the actual saints who have actually paid the price. Okay, so let's now go to verses 5 to 6 of Revelation 20 to hear about the first resurrection. So again, lots of terminology in the book of Revelation. The first resurrection. Revelation 20 verses 5 to 6. And it reads first in brackets, it says, The rest of the dead, and this gives us a bit of an answer to what we were just talking about, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So we know that these are people here on earth who have been beheaded because of their word of God and their testimony of Jesus. So we now hear how the rest of the dead will not come to life after a thousand until sorry after a thousand years. So the first resurrection is for those only who were martyred at the hands of the false prophet for not worshipping the Antichrist. Now there's a lot of other people who've come through the Great Tribulation who actually did worship the Antichrist, so they're still here or their descendants are still here on earth. So as this description says, this is a resurrection of blessing, power and privilege. Why? Because it says they will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him. Now the idea of more than one resurrection might seem very odd to you. You may not have heard this before, but in the book of John, in John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29, so that's John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. Love to take you on a journey around the Bible every time we talk. <laughs> John chapter 5, verses 28 to 29. Jesus describes them when he says to the Jews who were persecuting him at the time, he says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. This is the first resurrection that we're talking about here in Revelation. And then the second part says, And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. So this is the second later resurrection after the thousand years. So Jesus talks about these two different times of them rising or living, which means that they're going to be resurrected at different times. Now those <coughs> who do not have part in the first resurrection are not blessed and they are without privilege. The two events are separated by the thousand years, as I just said, because the rest of the dead are not given their resurrection bodies until the thousand years has passed. Now you may have heard, this is the part where you may have heard these terms that get bantered around saying pre and post-tribulation rapture. 
So a lot of people align their beliefs with I'm a pre I'm a pre tribulation I'm a post tribulation. So again, if we look at the scripture itself here, it says with a defeated enemy locked away in the abyss, that the great tribulation is over, and the saints who were executed by the antichrist are being raptured, which means that they're being given their resurrection bodies. And this happens when, as the scripture points out right now, it happens at the beginning of the millennial rule of Jesus here on earth. So that means that it's post-tribulation, it's after the tribulation. So those who have been resurrected are those who have been, what does it say? They've been beheaded because of their belief in the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Who did it to them? It was the false prophet who was forcing them to worship the Antichrist. So we can really quite clearly specify who they are and when it actually happened. So for me, this points to the fact that they could only be post-tribulation rapture. But to me, it's not something I get hung up on either. I just read what the word says. So we're now going to look at the second of the three themes that occur throughout the book of the Revelation chapter 20. Now after 1,000 years passes, so this is a book in one chapter that covers a long period of time, uh, Satan is released and he gathers an army to defeat Jesus and God's people, but inevitably it leads to his doom. So let's now go to verses 7 to 8 from chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And it reads, When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. It then says, specifies these two names, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number, it says, they are like the sand on the seashore. So it's quite disturbing. So for the thousand years of the direct reign of Jesus over this earth, Satan is bound and inactive. But as soon as he comes out, what happens? He's released and he's successfully able to organize such a large army that the Bible describes them as so numerous, they're like sand on the seashore. What does that tell you about people? Jesus has been ruling. Satan comes out. He's able to put together an uprising, if you will, a popular uprising, and people are once again prepared to go to battle against the Lord. So if you want to say that man's essentially good, <laughs> uh, doesn't sort of equate with this scripture to me. Okay, so my question to you, and it's quite a big question, I think, to think about is, why do you think God allows this to happen? Why would God put Satan in the abyss for a thousand years. Jesus would rule here on earth. People continue to fight and sin because they have a sin nature, but everything is judged in a righteous way. So society in general is very prosperous, it's very calm. And then after a thousand years, Satan's released again, only to raise an army so large that they can't describe the numbers. Why do you think God would let this happen? You think, oh, wouldn't he get it over and done with, and that's it? Gives men a second and a third and a fourth chance to be able to... Right. It perpetuates another chance to yeah. be uh, repentant. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I think it's just to show us that we need him. Aha. Uh -huh. Constantly. Right. So in other words, man on his own is not capable of his own salvation, is he? So it's a final, and because it's the last time, it's a final demonstration of man's rebellion and depravity, frankly. It's an outward conformity to the rule of Jesus has occurred during this period of time because Jesus has been ruling for a thousand years. But an inward embrace of the Lord is still up to the individual. This is what it tells us. We can conform to things in society on the outside, but inside we still have our own opinions and our own beliefs. And so the fact that Satan's able to come along and after a thousand years of him not uh, you know, parading around the earth and causing problems, 
he's able to raise an army. So what does it say about mankind? That's really the question, isn't it? And so it shows you that mankind is still prepared to be deceived. He's still prepared to rebel. And he's frankly fairly depraved as, as, as a human being. So in this, we see more of the important reason that God has for the millennial kingdom and allowing this final rebellion because for the entirety of human history mankind has done what this is the whole point what has mankind done turned away from god turned away from god and what are, what is what is one of the things that mankind does when something goes pear shaped what do they do blame god blame right and so all the way through history up until he put satan away Everything that went wrong in the world, people could say, well, that's because the world's corrupt and we have a sin nature and it's Satan's fault and blah, 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 blah. Okay, we take Satan out of the picture for a thousand years. Who are you going to blame? They're still doing the same thing. They're going to blame Jesus? No. And so it comes back firmly to people that they are still sinners at the end of the day. And so they blame their sinful condition on the environment that you live in. So sometimes if you work or live somewhere, you'll blame the society you live in, you'll blame the circumstances that are around you, you'll blame the place of work, they made me do this, all those sort of things. Whereas the reality is you have a free will choice. So that's the normal human condition. But the overarching thing there, of course, is I always blame the enemy. How many times would I have heard in my life, oh, the devil made me do it. Common phrase that people do, they do something wrong, oh, the devil made me do it. It's like, no, the devil didn't make you do it. So God gives mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil, or other social pathology. But by the end of a thousand years, Mankind still happily rebels against God at the first opportunity. So this powerfully demonstrates that the problem is in us, not just in our environment. And so this is part of the message, the final message that the Lord gives us. So if we ask who will these rebels be, of course they're going to be the descendants of those who survived the Great Tribulation, and they're going to be those who are potentially going to enter into the millennial kingdom. So they are from, as the scriptures say, they're from the four corners of the earth. And they're described in the same way as prophetic enemies of Israel who are called Gog and Magog from Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39. Now I'll say something about this because I've had this message preached to me before. There's an alignment with who is Gog and Magog. And the reason that happens is because people believe that what Ezekiel is talking about is the millennial period of time, not the time between the two temples. And if you actually read the scriptures carefully, you'll realize that the events that are occurring are the time between the two temples. One of the conspiracy theories about Gog and Magog is actually they're the Russians. So right now what's happening, they've invaded Ukraine. And so there'll be people out there saying, see, this is part of the end because Russia is invading Ukraine. Sorry, but it's a load of rubbish. But this is what this is what happens all the time. So let's now go and hear how, after all of Satan's efforts to raise an army, the battle ends before it even gets started. So we're going to go to verses nine and ten in uh, Revelation chapter twenty. So again, that's verses nine to ten. And it reads, they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, which of course is in, where's the camp? Jerusalem. Jerusalem in this time, it's not Armageddon, this one that's right. So that belief that Armageddon is the final battle, it's actually not the last battle. It's actually Jerusalem. And why? Because it goes on to say, the city he loves. And then it reads, But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the strategy of this vast satanic army is clear. 
is to destroy God's people and to destroy God's capital city. And of course, this is the city that God loves, as we mentioned, which is, of course, Jerusalem. Now, it shouldn't even be called a final battle because in this instance, unlike Armageddon, where the battle lasted for one whole hour, the battle never makes it because God wipes them out with fire from heaven and devours them before they even get to do anything. So it is at this point that God finally deals with Satan and his followers forever. And Satan is now cast into the lake of burning sulfur with the Antichrist, otherwise known as the beast, and the false prophet, indicating that hell isn't an end, but rather a place of eternal damnation. I don't know about you, but that, uh, that's a big worry, right? It's one thing to be punished for something, but can you get your head around being perpetually punished forever and ever? Picture something that you don't like, picture something that scares you, picture something that hurts you, whatever it might be, and then perpetuate that forever. It's incredible. And a lot of the scriptures talk about the darkness. You know, we always portray hell as the, the sulfur and the fire. But hell, if you actually read about a lot of scripture in the Bible, it talks about darkness. I produced a video about these scriptures. And so it's like me saying, if you're in your room in your house right now, and you turn the lights off, and there's no doors or windows, and you're just going to exist on your own in that state forever. No contact with anyone, no light, nothing. Just your inner void. That's it. How would you go? You would be stark raving mad. It would send you crazy. And so, as again, there's a, there's a video on the Jesus Movement channel that I talk about that. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the third and the last theme of chapter 20 from the book of Revelation. And that is the judgment of the dead from a great white throne, as it's called. And so we're going to begin by reading verse 11 uh, from Revelation chapter 20. So again, that's verse 11. And it reads, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. Now, a great white throne, what would you think that is a symbol of? They don't just call it a throne here, they call it great and white. What do you think they're trying to say? What's the Lord saying here? Purity. Perfect, that's one of the attributes. And what represents purity? It's the, what of those three words? Great white throne. Which word represents purity? White. White, white. that's right. Perfect. Okay, so we've got purity. Any other thoughts? What about throne? Judgment. Judgment. Authority. Authority, yeah. Who sits on a throne usually? King. Which represents? God. God. The which ruler. Ruler. <laughs> sovereignty. Mm. Right? The ruler over all people. So a great, a great white throne is a symbol of power authority and sovereignty and the color white represents purity and holiness the judge is jesus and the description of earth and heaven fleeing the throne makes it clear that there is absolutely nowhere that you can hide from this throne from when from which judgment will come so i hope you are paying attention to what i am going to say next this is very important this will answer a lot of questions and a lot of confusion for people. A lot of people are always very concerned about what happens at the end. Do I still, you know, am I a Christian? Am I saved? Does that mean I still get judged? Or no, I don't get judged anymore. What does it all mean? There's quite a bit of confusion around here. So I'm going to speak into this to help you understand exactly what's going to happen. Many Christians believe that they will never appear before this great white throne because our sins are already judged in Jesus at the cross. Or in other words, we don't escape God's judgment, but we do satisfy it in Jesus. 
However, Christians will actually have to stand before another throne, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. And so there's a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, that I'm going to read. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, and it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ. And this is where you may get concerned because it says, for we must all, there's the word, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, when you pass from your bodies to the world beyond, you have to give account according to what you have done. So in other words, yes, you are going to have to give account for your life, even as a Christian, as a saved person. And whether that's good or bad, you still have to give account for it. So it's like a performance review. Right? You have the good and the bad. It's not just a judgment in the sense of tell me all the things you've done bad. It's a balance scale. Now this describes a judgment, and here's the thing, of the works of believers. Now salvation is not by works, but this judgment is by the works of each and every one of us. At this judgment seat of Christ, what you have done will be judged. Your motives for what you have done will be judged. Paul, the Apostle Paul, presents essentially the same idea in 1 Corinthians, I'm not going to put the scripture up, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, when he speaks of a coming assessment of each one's work before the Lord. In that passage, he makes it clear that what you have done and your motive for doing it will be tested by fire, but here's the good news. So I'm going to allow you to breathe. The purifying of God is there to burn up everything that was not of him. You won't be punished for what was not done right by the Lord. It will simply be burned up as if, uh, sorry, and it will be as if you never did those things. So in other words, so you're going to come before the Lord. You're going to present the good and the bad. You're going to be judged on the good and the bad and the bad things on you because you are saved will simply be burnt off you. Why do you think that is? Because of what Jesus has done. Because of what Jesus has done, so that's the pathway there, but why? Why will it be burned off you? To make you pure. To make you pure. You cannot come into the presence of God without being made pure. And so part of the process of being made pure is to do what? is to confess your sins and repent. And so in other words, you're going to go to a final judgment in which you're going to take ownership of the things that you've done and the Lord is going to burn those things off you so that you are pure when you come before the Father. So you will simply be rewarded for what remains, not for what you've done wrong. So sadly, some will get to heaven thinking that they have done great things for God and will find out at the judgment seat of Christ that they really did nothing. So in other words, he knows. So this is almost like transparency, right? He knows what you've done. He knows you and he knows you. But he wants you to put up your hand so he can remove this from you. So in other words, it's an active form of repentance. Okay. So how are you feeling? It sort of started a bit sour, wasn't it? So hopefully you're feeling a bit of relief. But it's good to know because there's actually going to be these two different forms of thrones with different purposes. Okay, so let's now go to verses 12 to 13 from the book of Revelation chapter 20 that we're reading to find out about the book of life and the judgment of condemnation. So it's verses 12 to 13. And it reads, And I saw the dead, 
great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. So if anyone thinks there's no judgment as a Christian after getting through all this, they're not reading the word. There will be a form of judgment. So this, however, is not a trial, trying to determine what the facts are, because the facts are in. So here is the sentencing of someone who is already condemned. If you take notice of how the words are written, the use of the words say, standing before the throne. It's like somebody standing before the judge awaiting for sentencing. That means if they're awaiting sentencing, sentencing, beg your pardon, that expresses that they are already guilty and about to be sentenced. Is anyone not guilty before the Lord of sin? Of course, we're all guilty. But because this is a sentencing and not a trial, those who stand before the throne, this throne that we're talking about, are not asked to say anything. Many think when they get there that they're going to tell God a thing or two. Right? They're going to say, oh yeah, but that's not my fault because of, or if you were a good God, you wouldn't have allowed that to happen to me. You know, people, for example, they may lose a child in life to cancer, for example, and they'll bitterly blame God because he could have saved the child. And so they're going to go before God and they're going to potentially have this understanding that they're going to have an argument or a self-justification for their journey through life. But of course, that's not going to be how it is. The scripture says, you will be caught, judged according to what you have done, not what you have blamed on others. So what you have done is a past tense. In other words, it's already known. Not according to what you say in the present. So if you are not listed in the book of life, then you will be judged according to your works. So in other words, that works comes into play again. Those who refuse. So can you get the picture now? So there's the judgment from Jesus, right? If you're saved, you will basically fess up. Those sins will be burned away from you, but you will be in the book of life. But if you're not in the book of life, you're going to go to judgment and you're going to be judged according to your works, the scripture says. And those who refuse to come to God by faith will, by default, be judged and condemned by their own works, not by that of anybody else. So the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24, and again, I haven't got it to read it all through, but I just want to give you the essence of it, demonstrates to us that there are degrees of punishment for unbelievers according to their works. So in that scripture, he says, according to this or according to that, they will be judged accordingly. Okay, so that's uh, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24. So verse 13 that we've just read here in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, mentions the various sources from which the dead will be given up. Talks about the sea, talks about death, and it talks about Hades. What do you think that's for? Why is that put in there at this point in time? It says whether you're from the sea, whether you're from death, or whether you're from Hades. Okay, so two of them are death. The other one is a holding place, so to speak. Right, a, a place between heaven and hell until judgment happens. Why do you think it says the sea, death, and Hades? Any idea? Not a trick question. What happens if you die at sea? If you've been found. Yeah. What happens if you just go overboard? There's no burial, is there? So what this is talking about is that whether you're buried in a known place or an unknown place, or you're in a place of waiting for judgment, whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. Remember, Hades was there before Jesus moved it. 
at the time of his resurrection. So prior to his resurrection, Hades was filled up with people. Abraham was there, remember? He talked to the to uh, Lazarus, the poor man with the rich man outside. So we know both the good and the bad are in this place called Hades. So basically the Lord is saying, it doesn't matter where you are, where you come from, it doesn't matter whether you're buried or not, everyone will be judged. The Lord knows everyone. So let's now go to our final portion of scripture, Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 to 15. And it tells us how both Hades and death are thrown into the lake of fire, which is classed as the second death. We haven't got there yet. Why would it be called the second death? What's the first death? When you die. When you die here on earth. It's the natural death of the flesh, right? The second death is the death that you're going to have if you head off to hell. So it reads, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Why do you think it says that? Then death. Death is just normal, isn't it? Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. What is it saying? What does it say about death itself? In the future there will be... No place for it. There will be no death. There will be no corruption. And so therefore death gets thrown into the pits of hell it doesn't exist anymore so life will be eternal so those who are in Hades, whether good or bad that that decision waiting port for for what happens for eternity it too it's gone there's no need for it anymore so they'll be tossed into the lake of fire so the lake of fire is the second death and i was at the point where that's it nothing changes after that it's gone then it reads, anyone whose name was not found in the written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go there. Doesn't sound, it's, it's uh, yeah, what can I say? Uh, definitely don't want to go there. So the last echoes of sin are eliminated, basically. Death is a result of sin. Right? The reason that we die of the flesh is because of sin if you read the bible you'll see the very long-lived early people and then life length change because of sin hades is a result of death and so death is a result of sin and so it's got to go as well and so in other words the last vestiges of sin's unlawful domination are done away with once and for all when a person refers to hell the lake of fire is what they usually have in mind now I'm going to just open the door a little bit with information because the Bible uses three main words to describe where the ungodly will go when they die. So the first one is called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L. It's a Hebrew word and it means the place of the dead. It has no direct reference to either torment or eternal happiness. So the idea of Sheol is often accurately expressed to mean the grave, basically. It's a physical death. Hades. Hades is a Greek word and it's used on a different level because it describes the world beyond. In the Bible it has generally the same idea as Sheol because it doesn't differentiate yet at that point in time who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. It's that holding place after you die. Now here in Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 it speaks of the bottomless pit and this place is called the Abyssos in, in Greek. And it's a prison for demons, and it's also found in other books of the Bible, Luke, Peter, and Jude. Or more generally, it is considered part of the realm of the dead. And in Romans 10 verse 7, it uses it in the same sense of Hades. So we've got Sheol, and we've got Hades. Now the third word is a Greek word called Gehenna, and it's borrowed from the Hebrew language originally. So in Mark chapter 9 verses 43 to 44, Jesus speaks of hell, it's actually Gehenna, as it is in the Greek form. And the Greek translation of the Hebrew, it comes from the word Valley of Hinnom. And so this is where the true descriptions come from. The Valley of Hinnom, a place I've been, is a place that's directly outside the walls of Jerusalem. 
and it's the place where Molech worship and human sacrifice was practiced and it was also a large garbage dump where rubbish and refuge were burned. So in this place there was always dead people, people being sacrificed and smoldering flames and festering smells and all the rest of it. So in other words it was considered a, the pit of hell. It was a, a visual thing and a thing people could smell directly outside the walls of Jerusalem. So the Valley of Hinnom is between the Mount of Olives and the Temple of Jerusalem itself, a portion of it. So uh, it's graphic and it was an effective picture for the fate of the damned. So the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels um, from Matthew 20, chapter 25. It's described as a consequence of this place. So men only go to this place prepared for the devil and his angels if they reject God's salvation and condemn themselves. So when we have the use of the word Gehenna or the valley of Hinnom, it is associated with sacrifice, death, burning in hell and so on. And so we have those three uses. So this scripture, uh, which is pertaining to the lake of fire, is the second death. It's pertaining to this word Gehenna. Okay? So just as there is a second and a higher life, so there is a second and a deeper death because this one is eternal. And on that note, we come to the end of chapter 20. So it's a very, um, what can I say, a very sobering chapter. Um, the joy that we take out of this, of course, is that we know that Satan will be uh, come to an end. He will be cast into the pit with the false prophet and the Antichrist. Um, there will be a time of a thousand years, in, which is called the millennium. It will be a time of relative peace on the earth with Jesus ruling, but Satan will be released to, uh, to run amok around the earth for a short period of time. And all of the people, if they haven't had enough of it throughout their life's journey, they'll go back to Satan once again, but then they will be devoured and that will be the end of it. So that brings us to the, to the end of chapter 20. We have chapters 21 and 22 to go to finish the book of Revelation. So I hope you've been enjoying the journey and hopefully I've been able to shed some light on what's often a difficult book to read. Mm -hmm.